You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I am David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, your host, where my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect to get some tips and takeaways from each of my special guests. My podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I always appreciate that. Also, I do gratitude keynote speaking and gratitude coaching, and you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com and david at thatgratitudeguy.com, and those uh, links are also in the show notes as well. As you can see in the background, you can also reach me at thatgratitudeguypodcast.com. So let me get on with the show and introduce my guest. Always my favorite part of the show is my guest every week. No exception this week, I will just say very clearly, Chella Diaz. Chella knew at a very young age how to manage money. At nine years old, she would go to the farmer's market and knew the vendors that had the best produce at the lowest price. She purchased her car at 17 and her first home at 23. That's impressive. Chella was married for 17 years and has two sons. For over 15 years, Chella has been on a very spiritual, on her own personal spiritual journey, I should say. Chella has been hosting workshops to empower people to chart to charge their value and attract their ideal clients, something I've experienced personally, which is fantastic. You are the boss. Money is your employee, she says. Chella, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. I am really, so, this is. I'm, I'm so glad to have you. Your energy. I don't. People tell me I have some energy, but I meet people every so often that make me look like I'm walking in molasses, and you're one of those, so I have to kind of keep up with. So I always start off the podcast with, how did you and I meet? Just to give context to the people that are listening and watching. We are part, and it's really, I think this is key, right? Because we always go back. So we met at a mastermind. Correct. And it was interesting because there was, let's say there was seven of us. And it was interesting to watch. And this is a lesson. I, it's always about lessons here. This is a $5,000 lesson for here, folks. Uh, because it took us a while to, mm-hmm. to to connect. Right. We knew we wanted to set up a time and, you know, I mean, so I say this because sometimes the first time that uh, uh, we had a scheduled call, something happened and we could, so we had to reschedule, right? And sometimes when that happens, people drop the ball, right? That's people true. go into, well, it was not meant to be, you know, we can go into all of that. And sometimes that may be the case, but what if, that was the test for both of us Mm -hmm. to see if we were really wanting to reconnect. Yeah, absolutely. Not giving up. So we met and and it took us a while and look, it's it's like, what if we made that? Yeah, it's fantastic. And I remember that first call and I remember thinking there were a number of people on there. And I think eventually that the person that was head of the mastermind doesn't say, well, you got to all eat and meet each other individually, but it's really nice. Hey, let's you and me do an individual Zoom and get to know each other instead of in the context of the group where you're never sure if you want to say something somebody else is talking or what have you. But what I think is really interesting is I've said this before in previous podcasts, this is the case with you. You just meet certain people you just instantly like. And, and then there's other people that it's not that you don't like them. And that sounds sort of negative. It's just, you just don't have the same connection. And I had somebody recently that I met and it was kind of like the famous, everything was a one word answer. And I went, oh man, this is going nowhere. So do you enjoy your career? Yes. <laughs> okay. So where did you grow up? Texas. Okay. Thanks. So anyway, so sometimes there's going to be that, but, but as far as that connection, it's just really cool. And then the first time you and I did a zoom, I'm like taking copious notes and you're giving me all these and I hadn't planned. It. I thought we we're just going to get to know each other and you, you need to do this, this, and this, and it all made sense to me. So it was exciting. So, but speaking of what made sense to me, let's go back 
for the listeners and the viewers and talk a little bit about, I love the thing about the farmer's market and so much of about your aspect is money that you coach people on and do a great job at, I might add, but at nine years old at the farmer's market and then purchase a car at 17, first home at 23, which as I said, is quite impressive. Talk about how that started, that kind of journey and maybe where and how it came from. Was there somebody that was a mentor or a, a motivator of you or did it just sort of come out of your brain? I think I want to get good about all of this or how did that work? I, I just been good. I, I wish I could say that it was, I'm not going to throw stones here, but um, my mother was a housewife. Mm -hmm. So definitely managing money is not in her in her wheelhouse right it, it really isn't uh my dad was a baker and his belief is that you have to work hard for your money mm. so I, again I'm, I'm not throwing stones here but I, I want people to understand that it was me and i then i'm proud that it was me because nobody else in my family feels that way right right i say for me is i wanted to have my car and my dad still he's with us as of this recording and my dad still tells the story how clever i was i knew mm. to go to the jar i need to get however much money i needed depending on the list on my groceries right but what's really neat is that i always well my parents don't know this but i'm sure they won't listen um i always knew to i always treated myself to something like Not if i figure if i'm going and i'm saving all this money i'm going to so my treat was usually um carrot and orange juice you're oh, at the wow. farmer's market they're making fresh juice so that's right. to this day one of my favorite juices so i do remember making it a fun thing i'm going to save this much money and whatever i save i'm going to buy a treat to myself my yeah. parents did not know <laughs> I don't think I've ever shared that before either. Well, so. that's good. This, this goes out to millions and millions of people, as you know, so that you're going to know it now. But, you know, <laughs> I, I am always fascinated where the ideas come from and how it uh, how it came up. I, I wanted to be a speaker when I was 19. And I did a talk and I went to my car and I thought, I just want to be a motivational speaker someday. And that was 1969. So it's always you wonder sort of what is the germination of these things. But I think it's interesting. You bring up a really good point. My mom was a housewife. My dad was a baker. I think that what, based on what generation is, that they're my dad and my dad's dad. There was almost this thing, again, like you said, Chella, not throwing stones, but it was almost like, unless you work hard and bust your knuckles and all that, you do not deserve a paycheck. And whether it was passive income or any other way, royalties or all different ways you can do create income, unless you are just wringing your hands, and I think you really showed, and, and, and certainly that was part of your journey, that how that's not the case. Imagine, and, and this is real thing, imagine when I was offered $500, this was many, many, many moons ago, $500 to go do a speaking gig mm. at a high school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Right? And my was like, oh my God, this goes against everything I grew up with, because getting paid to go speak and share something that comes as second nature to me, mm -hmm. that goes against everything. So definitely yeah. that was the time, you know, expansion and growth and me reaching out to my mentors and my coaches, because there was tons of butterflies because sure. my body was like, wait, wait, where's the hard work? <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Because this is what I was told and this is what I grew up with. So it's been a journey all along and I could have said no, right? I could have said, no, I'm not going to do that because I was stepping into a very uncomfortable place. Well, and you think about your life too, it would be very normal to assume that because of your mother, you grew up to be a housewife yourself or possibly a baker working with your dad. And then you get your own bakery or do whatever in that career. Cause that's so common. My dad always wanted me to be an attorney and I just had no interest in that. But when you get the break free and kind of go do your own thing. And, and I think just like the, the carrot and the orange juice, the little treat. And I think that's so important too. And, and I just think that we get this we have this once we're 18 we have free will and we can do whatever we want but it's funny you mentioned the 500 dollars for the speaking gig and you know there's always gonna be people that are detractors and i'm a speaker and a coach and and so i remember someday i forget how long ago, it was a number of years ago so let me see if i get what are you your speaker so you just talk and you just get paid money so you just say you just make a talk and then they pay you you know, it's like, well, kind of, you know, so once again, so you don't have a shovel and a wheelbarrow. I mean, you know, it's just interesting. So, but when you, but I'm fascinated again, back to the farmer's market, did, did you, was there anything, was it the folks that you saw that your mom is the housemaker while well, that she's wonderful, she's a mama, I don't want to do that. Was there anything that was, that really inspired you or a person that you looked up to that was, you know, that you're kind of role model, if you will? 
No, no, but we're going to go back one more year, one year further to eight. When I was eight, uh, my dad said the girls must have long hair. Like oh, girls boy. are, oh yeah. So no, and I say this because I was a curious child. So I remember uh, doing chores for neighbors. And I remember that I knew a lady that she she cut hair at home. Like, so it's not like a beauty shop, nothing fancy. So I gathered enough money and I went to go get my hair cut. And I'm sure I had to lie because I, I'm sure that I had to say, yeah, my parents said it was okay for me to get my hair cut. Uh, so I don't remember that. But uh, when my dad got home, my hair was cut. My hair was short. Wow. I, I had a very strong sense of role genders like mm. I didn't go for the you know girls have to have long hair and this was eight I can't imagine that I really knew what I was doing except that I earned the money I went to go get my hair cut when my dad got home my hair was short mm -hmm. right it wow. was just a sense of I, I'm not going to be held down to this little box. No, girls don't have to have long Well, hair. and that looks like that was a theme for you because as you said, I'll get my hair cut and, and girls are supposed to have long hair and probably wear dresses and work in the kitchen and the fathers go to the bakery and, and make the bake the goods and so forth. So I, I imagine that theme has kind of carried you and treated you well throughout life, I'll bet. Absolutely. And just the, the with my car, right? I knew that I wanted to have a car because we lived in an apartment at the time and I was tired of walking to the laundromat. And I know that may sound silly, but I, to me, and, and this is great for the listeners, is what is that carrot that you want that's going to help you stay on track? For me, it was a car, right? right. For somebody, it could be a computer, it could be going to the prom, it could be a down payment for a house. What you want is not important, it is, is it strong enough to help you stay away from the shiny objects, especially mm -hmm. now, right? Because right. we can get so many things and we can get sidetracked for this instant gratification, which is what we talked about earlier. Right. Is what is that one thing? For me, buying a car, because I was tired of walking to, you know, and let me be honest, it was probably three blocks. So we're not talking <laughs> miles here, right? <laughs> <laughs> We're not talking miles, but for a 17 year old, but also what I gained. So that was my initial, I want to be able to drive to, drive to the laundromat. It would have been a lot cheaper if I just bought a washer and dryer. Mm -hmm. But what I gained, what I gained was freedom. Right. Because now I did not depend on my parents to take me anywhere. And I started to experience going to football games to other schools. So I was no longer just hanging around. And to me, that was valuable because I got to hang out uh, and to, I got to meet a lot of different people by going to different schools. So you're no longer just part of that small community. So right. to me, that was huge. And uh, I would also think, Chella, that to me, not to, I don't like to stereotype or generalize, but I just can't imagine there were a lot of other people with that attitude, because I think back about high school and college, spend as much money as you can, make your check, you know, get, go out and get a bunch of beer on Friday night, get drunk and the money's gone by Saturday. I can't imagine you had a lot of other people that were doing the same thing. And I'm so glad you said that because that, that wasn't right. But it's about choosing what you wanted to do. It's like, for me, it was important to have the car mm -hmm. and immediately Thereafter, I started saving because I knew that the next thing I wanted to do was buy a house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's for me, it just made sense. But mm -hmm. along with my getting my hair cut, I remember 15 at the time you were able to do go into an internship. Maybe 15. Well, that was when I first got my very first uh, working permit at the time. Mm. And my, I had a choice. I could go to work at the Air Force in El Segundo, California for free. Internship is free. Or I could go get a paying job. Mm -hmm. And that was the second argument I got to win with my dad because my dad wanted me to take the paying job. Oh, he I'll could bet. not understand why somebody would want to work for free. That was beyond what he was able to understand. I won. I said, no, I'm not going to work. And I won and I did the internship for the six weeks, which led to a paying gig nice. that was by far more than I would have made during the summer. Mm -hmm. 
And right. you know, when I think about your dad, not knowing your dad, of course, but I can't imagine he probably modeled the behavior that he had from his dad. That's kind of the way it worked. And that's so often. And that's why I think here, I'm just writing a note here, internship to full paying job is that, you know, we, we, it's sort of hard to break the chain sometimes. And, and we have that model. That's how we were brought up and, and so forth. And so I'm always impressed with somebody that breaks away and establishes their own sort of path. So talk about the, the employment uh, sort of journey, Chella, after you got the internship and went to the job, what was kind of your flow of jobs? What types of things did you do as you were really focused on making money and saving money and all that? Yeah, more office, definitely office uh, skills, right? Mm -hmm. So I started with the Air Force where I got to do a lot of clerical and I had a phenomenal mentor. And that was also the first time where I got to see a woman in charge of a department. Oh, interesting. So wow. now I'm Air like 16, 16 years old and I got my first experience and I got to meet some amazing people that had traveled all over the world, right? So it's about the connections. And I stayed in touch with a lot of them for many, many, many years. So it was the relationships, even though of course at the time I didn't know what relationships were, but after the Air Force, then I went, of course, we all have to have the experience of working at a fast food place. <laughs> right? Exactly. It's we right do it in California food. anyways. Right. Um, so the, the chain is no longer around, but I, I was good at organizing and I was good with people and things just made sense. So I was very quickly promoted to vice president of the night shift because I was still going to school. Right. Right. Nice. But it's 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 about I've been in the leadership position for a long time, even though at the time it didn't seem like that. I just saw it as I'm gonna make more money. Right. 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 And that means that I can get more be able to save faster for the house that I want to get. Right. Right. Exactly. So, right. So after yeah. that, I did go and I was a um I don't know. I don't know what we would call it, but basically somebody that took payments mm -hmm. um, at a finance company. Oh, OK. Sure. You know, whatever. I don't know what that was, but it, they no longer around. But it was one of those places where you took payments and a lady that was coming came in to make a payment. She just adored me, fell in love with me. There was an opening at her company at a bank mm. as a loan processor. And she thought I should apply. So and again, it's about the people that you meet, it's the connections that you make. So I applied for the job and I was there for 20 years. Wow. Wow. So I moved within that. I moved from a loan op, uh, a processor. And then, of course, the ultimate was when I became an underwriter. So right. as an oh, underwriter, yeah. you get to, I reviewed over 20,000 real estate loans. Oh, my gosh. Because I was there for so long. Um, and during that time, because I underwrote those loans, I got to see shopping patterns. I got to see savings patterns. I got to see how the, just because the doctor was making 500,000, that does not mean that he's financially sound. Exactly. Exactly. Right. But my person that owned an auto shop and was making $150,000 hmm. had no credit card debt had large savings, right? He lived way below his means below where his the means. doctor had the student loans, had the fancy car, the fancy house. So it's not always about what we see. Right. And when exactly. I do workshops, it's not about the picture that we see on the outside, right? Because we don't really know. And Chella, if you look at those 20,000, God, that's amazing, 20,000 real estate transactions, and you were able to evaluate them. And I love the example of the body shop guy versus the doctor, whatever, and over and above their means. Was there kind of a common thread that you could see through the people that, I guess, live below their means, but also the people that overdid it? Was there something, you, lack of discipline? Was it they were just more arrogant or any of the people you interact? Was there any common thread that made them go above or below their means and why they did it that you could figure well, out in your view? I, again, I didn't talk to them, but also we have the okay. third wheel, and, and that is the people that did make the money, the people mm -hmm. that donated, who are they donating to? Mm -hmm. The people mm -hmm. that automatically paid themselves first, no matter what. Oh, yeah. So there's that other third bucket, if you will, the third personality, and those are the ones that I was really interested in. Those are the ones that I really wanted to get to know because the discipline of paying themselves first, no matter what, right. but also there was 
they're paying themselves, but they're also giving back. Yeah, yeah. And to me, that was huge. And that was part of what I began to teach. And I began to host workshops for elementary uh, students at the time mm. um, because I wanted to go back and I wanted to share. Yeah, that's such a huge thing too. And, and I think it does say that automatically pay yourself first. I, I went to a 50 year high school reunion and I was driving home and I thought, what do I know 50 years later that I'd love to tell my kids? And I put together a list of 10 things, but one of the ones I won't go through all 10, but one of the ones I put is, is save 10% of everything you make. And so I thought if you started out as you're 18 or 19 to 20, you make a thousand dollars, you could live on 900 and every month, 10% went away or every two weeks, whatever it was, went into a savings. By the time you get to be high school reunion in 50, you'd have a couple million bucks, a million and a half. You'd have something huge just in that automatic. But that pay yourself first is huge. I know there's a number of books been written on that. So, so then talk about what happened after the workshops and kind of lead into how you got to what you're doing today. So after the workshops and after the corporate job, the, the corporate job was shut down and I knew I did not want to get go back to the same of course there was the divorce that happened during that time as well mm. so the divorce and then leaving the co corporate world and uh going and really finding out what my purpose was and mm. i know everybody says that but for me i knew what i did not want to do and i knew that i did not want to be at the nine to five underwriting loans um or you know whatever it was Another fun job that I had is still in the in the corporate world was um, filing SARS, suspicious activity reports. Oh, really? Oh, that's interesting. And so those SARS are filed with the FBI. And my name was the only name on those reports. Oh, be darn. And so I got to, I had the FBI for the suspicious activity reports on speed dial. At the time, wow. they had a, um, a branch in uh, Texas. So it was fun because I had a home office, which had the corporate number. Um, and so it was fun for them to call my house. And, you know, I mean, it was the, the office. And so that was really fun. And I learned a lot also about what people are willing to do to get the house, their dream home. And the things that are ready to, let's face it, fake, falsified. What documents that are willing to falsify well, in order to get their And I was just going to ask you what kind of, what was your biggest takeaway from that? That may be the answer right there. It just must be interesting to get a window into people's behavior with those suspicious activity reports, because like you said, whether it's a house or whatever they're going after. So again, was there much of a common thread of the type of person? Was it, could you dial in this type of person and this type of activity and their type of job or did it go across the board? All sorts of people would get the SARS. All, all kinds of people. Um, but I also, I did find there was one person ready. Let's say that I was the instigator. Let's say that I came to you with such a phenomenal opportunity. David, I can get you into this house and you're only going to have to pay this amount. That means that I would falsified all the documents, mm. but it was a two way, right? Because that means that you knew you didn't care to ask, well, how am I going to be able to get this house? I know right. that I can't afford it. So right. it was interesting that people, you know, there were the organizers, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and they were just doing it day and night. That was their whole full-time job is getting going towards uh, and getting people to sign on the dotted line so it was interesting. It was just interesting to be part of that. Well, and that's um, because that was a commission type basis too, right? So the more they closed, the more they made their money. So I can see them dying on the dotted line. Absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. So it came down to greed, right? It came mm. down to greed and not really, in some cases, I do believe they had the best uh, interest in the, you know, the clients having their dream home, um, but not in all. I, I can't say that it was always the case in, in all of them. Well, and you know, you just, I just wrote down, came down to greed and there's a program on, uh, I forget CNBC called American greed. And it's just amazing if I have a lot of the really famous people, Bernie Madoff and the people that did all these nasty things and Ponzi schemes and so forth. And uh, I, I think we'll, I'll save another podcast with you just about greed alone, because what motivates people? Why do you need 15 cars? Why do you need five houses? Whatever it might be. And I just am always curious about the mindset, because you talked about 
And in fact, I would ask you right at this very moment, that makes me segue into this. How do you define your purpose now? After all these things you've done, you said the divorce, the leaving the corporate world, and that kind of made you stop and think about your purpose. How do you kind of define your purpose now? My purpose now is really showing up with the gifts that come as second nature to me, helping others. Helping my high school students, the first book that I published, it was to help high school students look at money in a different way. Mm. Not, you know, I mean, just really, it's about, yes, keeping a spending plan. Yes, living within your means, doing all those things, but knowing the money is not what's going to bring you happiness. Yeah. So my purpose, and, you know, I went on the spiritual journey. I have over 15 healing certifications because I wanted to find, and I'm my best client because I tested all of what I learned on myself, but it, it's about helping people get from A to Z, helping them, the, 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 the shortcut their learnings, mm -hmm. right? It's about helping them get there for those that are ready to get there. So cool. And then again, the shortcut, when I think about shortening the learning curve or anything that helps people maybe not stub their toe as much and that maybe makes their job or their journey just a little bit easier. I love that showing up with the gifts, look at money in a different way. Money won't make you happy. From your vantage point, Chella, not so much about you, but again, observing all these people that I look at those $20,000 loans you processed or did the underwriting or what have you. What do you think, what do you think really makes the average person happy? from your vantage? Because I think a lot of people think it's money and it's not money. But what do you think? I think, and what I have found is, is doing the things that you love. Yes, we all have to make money. Yes, we all have to have, you know, a roof over our head if, or a tent or whatever that may be, the tiny house, whatever that is. So there's certain things that you're going to need money for, but what you choose to do with the rest of it, you know, is right. it volunteer? Some people want to make a lot of money because they want to be able to donate. True, true. Some people are not so much interested in making a lot of money because they're more interested in donating of their time, mm -hmm. right? So it's about doing really, truly, you know, even if you're a garbage collector, right? You want to be able to clock in your six hours, eight hours doing that because you want to be able to be home and go to the little league with your kids exactly. or volunteer, exactly. right? So it's, it's about really doing the things that bring you joy, knowing, of course, that some of the things that we do are not always going to be the, the thing that we want to do, right? There's, it's not exactly. always going to be. Well, and that right. ends up being a pretty good uh, example of life. It's like the roller coaster. It's not always up or down. It's a series of ups and downs and so forth. But, but I think it's interesting when you're going back to what people need. I read something recently, like I forget how they came about, but the average thing was about you need about seventy-five thousand dollars a year to to lead a decent life, you know, and have a house and you know, a car, food, or pay the utilities, what have you. Beyond that, you really don't need that much. And so it's interesting again that aspect of greed and and just the fear that people have over money. And the fear of, of course, they talk about fear of missing out, but also about what if I don't have any security? I think money represents so much security to a lot of people that I've read that some of the people that have the most money are the most fearful of losing it, you know, and it's just, it's so strange. So what a, what an interesting, so we're going to wrap up in about five minutes. I've actually written down some tips that you've, you've given me, but I want to ask you the average person that's listening to this, that says, you know, my, you know, once I want to think about my relationship with money and look at money in a different way, what would be one or two or three tips you might give them in order of importance to really get a grip on it and have a good handle on money and how it works for them? I think tip number one is go back to when you were a child and remember the money conversations that you remember listening to. Mm -hmm. I shared with me, my dad is you have to work hard, mm -hmm. right? And so how the, the, the conversation, and it doesn't matter what you listen to, but how do those conversations have, are affecting what you're currently doing with money, mm -hmm. right? So if it was working hard, are you working 12 hours a day, 16 hours a day? Because you're thinking you know, you're living up to that standard. So right. go back to whatever that was and then connect it to what you're currently doing. I like that. That's huge, mm -hmm. huge. And when you go out and you're investing in whatever it is you want, the car, the house, is it really for you or is it because somebody else? Are you mm -hmm. living up to your standards or is it to impress others? Let's be yeah. honest. Impressing others is a big thing of what we do. Yeah. So no and that, problem. right. So you're having to keep that job that you don't like 
because you need to keep up this lifestyle. Right. So you, and I know there's a lot of quotes, right? So you're making money to impress people that you don't even like. <laughs> so yeah. How does that make sense? Yeah. And my third one will be really, truly be honest with yourself. Take an inventory of where you are. Is this the job that you really want? Is this the life that you really want? Is it really bringing you joy 80% of the time? It's not going to bring you joy 100%. No, nothing does. But if it's not bringing you joy at least 60 to 70% of the time, it is time to rethink what you So do. good. So good. Be honest with yourself. Take an inventory. I do a um, sort of an exercise in one of my talks where I have it called the friendship evaluator. And is it time to reevaluate your friendships? And the first thing is somebody that maybe uh, you want to disassociate with from. And then the second thing is maybe somebody you want to limit your connection with. And then the fun one is the third one. Like when I met you, somebody you want to expand your association with and talk to them more. Right. And then the fourth thing is who would you like to mentor or have them mentor you? And the whole idea is maybe it's time to reevaluate those friendships. And I always use the same example. If you went to Starbucks and then you went to your car after you met with a person, do you feel the same, better or worse? And if it's worse, you may want to disassociate with them. And if it's better, you may want to think about in, enhancing the association. So I think that taking inventory of your life, I just kind of wrote down here too, is um, it, that's, that's really, really good. So, well, I'm going to uh, wrap up in just a couple of minutes, but I always, and I've got some other takeaways that I'm going to mention as well from Ms. Diaz, but I always leave my last question for my guests is always the same. And that is, is on this date today, what does Chella know at this age? that you have liked to know at 18 that would have really helped you, that you know now, but you would have liked to have known at 18? That it really, when people criticize me, it's not so much about me, but it's about where they are. Mm. If I would have learned that a little bit sooner, I think I would have been in a different place. That's so good. It's so funny because so many people act out and the whole concept of self of self esteem. When people criticize me, it's not about me. It's about where they are. People right. say it's, a reflection, do right? it's, it's where they come in. They're looking at it from their perspective, their, their color lens. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so important. And I even would add another thing to that Chella is that when I use the, the self esteem meter one to 10, and 10 is the best and one is the worst. I ask people a lot when I'm coaching, what, where would you rate your self-esteem? And they'd say, oh, like maybe a seven. And I go, okay, so two questions. Number one, and, and they're rhetorical. You can think about them. Number one, what would have to happen to go from a seven to an eight? I mean, what do you think would have to happen? Just think about it. And then the other thing I tell them, which relates back to what you just said, when people criticize me, if you're a 10, the criticism is going to roll off your back, like water off a duck's back, better than if you're a five. And then it just, when you feel that good about yourself, it just, that stuff's like, yeah, whatever. And that's, that's their business and too, so forth. So, well, let me just go over a couple of things. Thank you so much for being a guest today. And I, I'm going to mention these couple three again, but just for the benefit of kind of putting a ribbon and a bow on it. I like uh, something you said earlier about what is the carrot that you want? Stay away from shiny objects. That's so true. And this is all around the aspect of your relationship with money. Uh, I like to think about the internship and then that ultimately got to a full paying job. That's such a good example of paying your dues. And, you know, everybody, a lot of, not to criticize today's generation, but I think a lot of people just want to be Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos. Nobody wants to start at the bottom. They just want to be at the top. And sometimes you got to pay those dues and so forth. And uh, the third thing I mentioned too, I love automatically pay themselves first. So, so powerful. And uh, then if the bills don't get paid, that's fine. But at least you're, you were paid for the month that you worked and so forth. Giving back was huge, as you said, and then doing the things you love, which I think are so important. You know, and there was a book written years ago, Marcia Sinclair, do what you love and the money will follow. And even though it was a good book, the title kind of said it all, which is really neat. And then the final three things that you said that I really liked, uh, number one, think back to your childhood and remember the conversations you had and how they affected you then and then how they affected you today. And I I'm, I'm think you're certainly saying that you might have some, some imprint on you that needs to be broken or needs to be changed. And it was drilled into your head, that thing about you can't possibly, you know, just get money without putting in a lot of blood, sweat and tears. 
Uh, number two is the car, the item for you, or is it to impress others? Boy, there's some self-esteem and honesty about, are you driving that because of that? And I know as I've gotten older, that's certainly changed. And it's just so hopefully almost non-existent important, but certainly much less important than when I was younger. And then number three, uh, maybe the best of all, be honest with yourself and take an inventory of your life and make changes and things that, that might come up. So, uh, but just definitely yield on the better tracks. I think Everybody, when, when they get derailed, what's the first thing they say? You want to get back on track. If you fall on the horse, fall off the horse, it's not that you fell off the horse. It's the fact that you got back up, which is impressive and stuff. So, well, thank you, Chella, so much. And let me wrap up with a couple of things for the viewers and listeners. As I mentioned earlier, my podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what I hear, what you hear. I always appreciate that. And also, I know that people are struggling with all sorts of life issues, and I do have a program for you. It's called my Gratitude Coaching Program that will give you a coach that fully believes in you and can propel you forward to achieve anything your mind can conceive. The support you receive is unmatched in getting you to believe in you and make changes that you've been wanting and needing to make. Whether it's your finances, your relationships, your career, or your life's journey that you want to change, then this is the program for you. Gaining a complete understanding of your challenges, asking powerful questions, providing guidance, and a very high level of accountability along with an attitude of gratitude all combined to ensure your personal success. My four-month proprietary gratitude program is available for my podcast listeners, and they will receive one extra month free if you get it, hear about it through the podcast. As I mentioned earlier, for more information on any of these things, I'm at thatgratitudeguy.com or email david at thatgratitudeguy.com. And a couple last things. I'm excited to tell you about a new app that I am part of. It is called the KS Media Group, and it features the world's best podcasters and influencers. Simply go to the App Store and download the KS Media Group app. You can then sign up for a free account to gain exclusive access to all the various influencers and podcasters information, and you can also connect with yours truly as well. Also, we're looking for entrepreneurs who are making positive change in the world that might like to join the group too. So let me know if you're interested in that. And then for those of you that like to get my Monday morning minute, it goes out every Monday morning, a 60-second video to start your week off on a positive note. You can just go to your text and type the word gratitude guy, all one word, and text it to 22828. That's five digits, 22828. And then the message box, gratitude guy, all one word. So thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you next time. I always appreciate the support. In the meantime, I'm David George Brooks, that gratitude guy. And remember, be grateful and never quit. So long. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us, and you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.